Good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here today, kicking off the talks on the Cosmos stage. And I've never had such a beautiful audience. And I'm not actually talking about you guys, I'm talking about the moon behind me. I finally got to see it, I'm so excited. No, you are, you are beautiful as well. And today I want to tell you how the solar system has changed my life. And that sounds a bit cheesy, but it's absolutely true. And hopefully in the next 40 minutes, you'll see exactly what influences the solar system has had on me and my family. Um, not, not, none, uh, apart from mentioning, the fact that I now have the solar system tattooed on my arm. So I can never forget the order, um, but there are other reasons that the solar system has changed my life as well. I became interested in space when I was uh, a lot shorter than I am now. And I know I'm short, but I'm older than I look. So I was a lot younger when I was first interested in space. And becoming interested in space and astronomy and astronauts has meant that that has affected all the things that I've done in terms of my career. And being in the British space industry, being based in the British space industry, has been fantastic. I've got to travel the world. I've got my PhD. I've got to use data that's come from satellites orbiting Saturn. I've got to meet incredible people. And that is the main thing for me that I think has um, really changed my life, is the meeting the people. And of course, Saturn. Saturn will always be my favorite planet after studying it for four years for my PhD. Now, studying physics and astronomy has made me feel a bit like a, a Jill of all trades, because when people ask me what physics and, and astronomy have given me, it's quite hard for me to tell them. Um, I feel a bit of a kind of, I don't really know who I am in a way, because I'm Dr. Kanani, I've got my PhD, I'm um, Sheila, that's my first name, I'm a teacher, so I get called Miss quite a lot, now and again I do get called Dad as well, um, I'm not anyone's dad, especially not my GCSE astronomy class. Um, I'm married, so I'm Mrs. Pearson. I've got numbers and letters before and after my name for different things, you know, sort of representing different organizations. I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher, I'm a physicist, a teacher, an author recently, and I'll mention that towards the end, a mummy as well for the last three years, very proud, and I'm an astronomer but I'm definitely not an astrologer. And if you don't know the difference, do try and find out. Although, you know, that there's a place in my heart for astrology as well. Don't quote me on that. But for today, I will be um, talking to you as Dr. Sheila Kanani, the Education Outreach and Diversity Officer at the Royal Astronomical Society. What's the Royal Astronomical Society? Well, it's a learned society. We will be 200 years old next year. I won't be 200 years old, but the organization will. And the RAS represents astronomers and geophysicists all across the globe. We're a membership organization and um, we have about 4,000, just over 4,000 members. And our offices are based in Piccadilly in central London, but we do represent people internationally. And our first president was the guy on the bottom left, William Herschel, who actually um, was the first person to see the planet Uranus, although he didn't name it Uranus at the time. And our current president, and hopefully Mike won't mind me saying this, is um, Mike Cruz, uh, pictured there next to William Herschel. And you can see in even in 200 years, even the hairstyles of the astronomers haven't changed. And that's partly why I'm talking to you today, because I want to show you that astronomers can be anyone and everyone can be an astronomer, even little old me. And if you are some of the younger people or even some of the older people in the audience and you're interested in a, a career in the space industry, the UK is a brilliant place to be at the moment. Um, there are loads and loads of jobs and there are going to be loads of more jobs in the UK um, space industry in the next 30 years. So do keep an eye out. And if you're interested, you don't just have to be an astronaut. I know Tim's here somewhere today, but there's lots of different jobs. You could be a radio astronomer, an astrobiologist, a teacher, a research scientist. You could be a planetary scientist like I am. You could work for different types of industries. You could protect the world from space weather. Or well, there's a bunch of unusual jobs in the space industry as well, like space journalism, space lawyer, 
um, a spe science presenting. Basically, if you love space and you love anything else, you can be in the space industry. I recently saw an advert for a space vet because there are more and more animals going up into space and you need someone to be able to look after them. So if you're interested in, be in being a vet and you love the space industry, please do join us. We're a lovely place to be. And if you're interested and you want to find out more, do have a look at these two websites, UK SEDS, which is the UK Student Exploration and Discovery of Space, and spacecareers.uk. Um, if you're a young person and you're looking for work experience or jobs in the UK space industry, that, that website is a perfect place to be. I have various role models in the space industry, and I do try and look towards the female role models. And this lady here is Fiametta Wilson. So the RAS started in 1820, but it wasn't until 1916 that they allowed women to be part of the organization. And she was one of the first, um, first w women fellows or members of the RAS. And she was a planetary scientist. And she was so incredible because she used to go out during the, during the, second, uh, during the First World War and m look for meteorites and look and try and... Um, calculate where they're coming from and write everything down in a little notepad with a pencil. She used to go out at night during the bombings with a little lamp and she was so dedicated to her science that she was actually arrested and the police thought she was a spy during the war. But I think she's amazing partly because she's a planetary scientist and as you can see I love planetary science. I've got planets on my dress as well. Um, but one of my issues with planetary science is that it's really hard to imagine the size and the scale of the solar system. Because when you're at school, you're presented with pictures like this. And I want, to, I want you to have a think, and you, you're welcome to shout out, but I might not hear you. What is wrong with this picture? Um, for, and, and also, what planets are shown, and what could you fix about this picture? The size, yeah. The distances, I'm only picking up some of the things, but basically everything is wrong with this picture, apart from the order. So you've got the sun in the bottom left corner, then you've got Mercury, Venus, Earth with the moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. The planets are in the correct order. That is the only thing that is right about that picture. The colors are wrong, the sizes are wrong, the distances are wrong, the rings are wrong, the size of the moon's wrong, everything else is wrong with this picture. So I'm going to test you by um, you have to now work out if we scale down our solar system using objects that we are familiar with, you're going to have to work out which objects represent the eight planets in our solar system. Not the Sun, not the Moon, not Pluto, but the eight main planets. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And our objects are a watermelon, a grapefruit, an apple, an orange, two cherry tomatoes, because two planets are similar size, a blueberry, and a peppercorn. And those are representing our eight planets. So have a think or chat to the person next to you. Which, which objects do you think represent those different planets? OK. So what we're going to do, I'm going to get you to shout out the planet that you think is being represented by that object. And the loudest one is hopefully going to be the right answer. So what planet do we think is the watermelon? Okay, okay, yep. Those of you that shouted out Jupiter, you're absolutely correct. Jupiter would be about the size of a watermelon in our scaled down solar system. Okay, then we've got a large grapefruit. Okay. Okay, most of you, I think, were shouting out Saturn, so well done. The next one, people should enjoy shouting out because everyone has toilet humor. So I've given you a bit of a clue there. Which one is the next one? Yeah. That was the loudest one. Everyone lo loves shouting out silly words. Uranus, as I pronounce it, is the size of a large apple. And then what do you think's next? <laughs> Neptune. You guys are on fire. Neptune. And then we've got two cherry tomatoes representing two planets. It's 
not Mars, not Mercury. Ve okay, so Venus and Earth represent the, well, the two cherry tomatoes represent the Earth and Venus. We've only got two planets left, so what do we think the blueberry might be? Oh, we've got a bit of a split between this side and this side of the room. You're saying Mars? Okay, you're saying Mars and I'm hearing Mercury that side. It is Mars. So well done, well done you guys. And last but not least, we have our peppercorn, which is Mercury. So you can see that Jupiter being about the size of a watermelon, Mercury being about the size of one peppercorn, our solar system is incredibly varied in size. And we haven't even started talking about the scale yet. So this is a more realistic picture of our solar system. This is not showing the scale, the distances between the planets, but it is showing the relative sizes in relation to the sun. And again, we've got the sun, and then those of you with good eyesight can see Mercury, then Venus and Earth, Mars, um, and then a bit of a gap between, um, Mars and Jup uh, between Mars and Jupiter, then Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and again, if you've got good eyesight, you are able to see Pluto as well, which is still part of our solar system, even though we don't call it one of the eight planets anymore, but that's always up for discussion. And like I said, that picture doesn't show us the scale of the solar system either. So can I have about five volunteers? Don't all run up. Can I have one person from that group over here? You can kind of help, you can decide yourselves from there. And then can I have one person from the school group at the back here? And then, can I have two people from the school group here and one from the school group there? Thank you. Okay, so when you are up, nice to meet you guys, just mind the chair. What I'm going to get you to do, hello, is represent different planets. So. I would like to start, well, okay, not just representing the planets, I'd like to start with someone who would like to be the sun. Who thinks their light shines the brightest? Oh, okay, go on then, what's your name? Ollie. Ollie, Ollie, can you come here and be the sun? And then, what's your name? Max. Max, Max, can you come and stand about that far away from Ollie? And then what's your name? Bradley. Bradley, can you come and stand about there? And then what's your name? Lacey, can you come and stand there? And um, what's your name? Hamza. Pardon? Hamza. Hamza, can you come and stand about here? Okay, so we've got the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and I think I'll be Jupiter. So what I'm showing you here is the relative scale of the solar system scaled down onto something we've all used before, a toilet roll. So imagine, the sun is at zero sheets of toilet paper. Then we start to unravel the toilet paper and we get to Mercury. We keep unraveling and we get to uh, Venus. We keep unraveling, we get to Earth, we keep unraveling and we get to Mars. That, those four inner planets are all pretty close into the sun. For Jupiter, Jupiter from the sun is about 50 sheets of toilet paper away. So I'd have to get off the stage to be Jupiter. And if you wanted to get to Neptune or Pluto, you'd need over 200 sheets of toilet paper. So it would be at the other end of our, of our exhibition hall. So the, the, the furthest bits of our solar system are really, really far away, but the inner planets are really quite close into the sun. Can we have a round of applause for our planets and our sun? You guys can go and sit back down again now. Thank you. So the solar system is a massive place, and human beings have only gone as far, physically have only gone as far as our moon, but we have sent satellites and spacecraft to all reaches of the solar system to different extents, which means that we have incredible photos of the solar system and parts of the solar system like this one. This is our sun, very, very active place. And just to show you the, the Earth to scale, the Earth is tiny in relation to the sun. It's an incredible image, and that is a real image, a real picture of our sun. And then we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and you can see that they are all quite similar in size, 
um, Venus and Earth are about the size of our cherry tomatoes. And I'm not going to talk about everything in the solar system today because I just don't have time, but I am going to point out some cool things. So first of all, I'd like to show you Phobos, one of Mars's moons. And I like the story behind this because in the 1950s, the science advisor to the president of the United States wrote him a letter and said, Phobos, this moon, is a funny shape. It has a massive crater in it, and it has a strange orbit around Mars. Therefore, the only way I can work out that it has been created is by Martians. So in the 1950s, people still thought that there were objects in space created by aliens who lived on Mars. And that just shows scientists get things wrong. And it's absolutely fine to get things wrong as long as you admit to your mistakes at the end. And then I love this picture of Jupiter taken by the New Horizons spacecraft when it was on its way to Pluto. It's such a beautiful planet. And there is a spacecraft at the moment going around Jupiter called Juno, and it's got astronauts on board. Does anyone want to have a guess as to what those astronauts are? You have to shout again, because I won't be able to hear you. Just shout. They're not animals. They're not bugs. They're not dogs. They're, well, they're sort of robots, because there are, there are you know, bits. There is, it is a satellite. I'll tell you, the, the, the astronaut going around, or astronauts going around Jupiter at the moment are Lego people. There are three Lego people made by the real Lego company, but made from aluminium instead of plastic because of the harsh environment of space. And they represent Jupiter, Juno, and the astronomer Galileo. And they're going around Jupiter at the moment. And that's just to show you that our scientists have a sense of humor as well. And then my favorite planet is Saturn. I studied it for four or five years using this satellite, the Cassini spacecraft, an incredible mission that orbited, um, orbited Saturn for almost 14 years, so longer than a lot of the people in this audience's lives. 14 years meant that we have seen Saturn in incredible detail and glory, and we are basically rewriting the textbooks about Saturn at the moment. And I just wanted to pick out a couple of cool things this is one of the moons, Mimas, and I like this moon because it's got a massive crater in it, the Herschel crater, and if we had a crater like that on the Earth, it would take out the whole of Australia. So it's pretty impressive that this tiny moon managed to survive that impact. But I like it also because it reminds me of something from science fiction. Any ideas? So those of you that are old enough to have watched the Star Wars films, it looks like the Death Star. But the first Star Wars film with the Death Star in it came out before the first close-up photograph of the moon. So who came up with the idea first? Was it, was it the, the formation of the solar system or was it George Lucas? We will never know. And then my second, well, my most favorite moon, but the second moon that I'm showing you today, this is Enceladus. It's a tiny little moon. If Enceladus was the size of your thumbnail, Saturn would be about the size of a double-decker bus. So it's a tiny little moon going around Saturn. But it's really important. It's covered in ice, and at the South Poles, there are cracks in the ice, and it's spewing out liquid water. And it's salty water, and it's got carbon and ammonia and all these building blocks for life in. And underneath the ice, we think there is a salty water ocean. And maybe, just maybe, if we could drill through the ice and swim about in that salty water ocean, we would find extraterrestrial life. So as some kind of um, alien life forms on this tiny little moon of, of, of Saturn. And it's also incredible because as it spews out that water and orbits around Saturn, it actually creates one of Saturn's rings, the E-ring. So it's a really incredible tiny little moon in our solar system. And then moving on to Uranus, we don't know as much about the planet Uranus as two pictures of the same planet, but what you will notice is that it's got rings, but they are on the north and south pole. So if you imagine Saturn has rings around its equator, Uranus has rings on its north and south pole. And what we think it happened there 
is that when Uranus was very, very young, it got smashed into and something, um, something crashed into it and actually knocked it on its side, which means that it rolls around the sun instead of spinning around the sun. And it has 42 years of summer followed by 42 years of winter. So it's a pretty crazy place. And then we have uh, Neptune. And again, we don't know as much about it because we haven't visited it in as much detail but it's one of the furthest reaches of our solar system. It's a very stormy place and a very cold place. And then we have Pluto. And this picture of Pluto is incredible because when I was little, all we knew about Pluto was a little fuzzy dot. And then New Horizons flew past and took this picture. And the incredible bit is the very smooth kind of heart-shaped bit, which tells us that Pluto is active. It must have volcanoes on it to make that nice, smooth section of Pluto but they're probably ice volcanoes or cryo-volcanoes rather than the, the lava hot vo volcanoes that we have on Earth. But the other reason I like that section of Pluto is because of this. Does anyone know who that dog is? That's Mickey Mouse's dog, Pluto. And that was just found on the internet. But once you, un once you see that, you can't not see it. And it's just funny that it matches exactly with that gap. OK, the final thing I want to talk to you about is inspired by this lady here. She's called Caroline Herschel. She is the sister of William Herschel, who was the um, first president of the organization that I work for. And she was incredible because she was the first female person in the UK to be paid to be an astronomer. She worked for the king at the time, um, back when women were not allowed to do science. And back in um, 1828, she won the first gold medal awarded to a woman from the R. And the next woman wouldn't win a gold medal from my organization until 1996. So she was really cool. And what she did, amongst other things, was discover eight comets. Now, a comet is a big ball of ice. A comet, comets live at the edge of our solar system, way past Pluto in a place called the Oort Cloud in the Kuiper Belt. And when the, when the solar system was formed, the sun was formed first, and then the leftover rocks made the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Leftover gases made Jupiter, Saturn, and then you're getting out further and further out, so the, the planets were colder and had ices as well as gases, so Uranus and Neptune. And then you're so far away from the sun, remember our solar system, our toilet roll solar system, you're so far away from the sun that at the edges of the solar system, what is formed are basically giant snowballs. So comets are, imagine a giant snowball. So imagine something like that moon globe, but made of ice and full of other things, not just, um, not just water ice, living at the edges of our solar system. And they orbit the sun, they're part of our solar system, but they don't visit us that often. They might visit us once every 70 or 80 years, or once every 200 years, or once every 1,000 years. And there are some that we know of that visit regularly. So those of you that will be alive in 2061, have a think about how old you'll be. That is when the next great comet will grace our skies. So do remember in 2061 to look up, although you will be looking up all that time anyway, to have a look at the, that great comet in 2061, because it will be quite an impressive sight. And what happens is they orbit the sun, but they orbit in a highly elliptical orbit, which means that instead of going round the sun like the planets, they live at the edges of the solar system and then come in like a slingshot, although at a sort of different speeds to a slingshot, and orbit round the sun and then come back out again, which is why we don't see them that often. And if they're giant, dirty snowballs, what will they do as they get, it, get in towards the sun? They'll start to melt or sublime in this case, which means that they go from a solid straight to a gas, but that's a, that's a discussion for another day. Um, as they start to, to melt, we start to see them. So human beings have known about comets for pretty much since we've been able to look up. And in the top right picture, it's the Bayo Tapestry from 1066, and there is a comet stitched into that tapestry. But because we didn't know what, what they were, all we could do was look up. We didn't have the technology to find out what they were. People were scared of them. They thought they looked like hairy stars, so they were called cometes. 
but people, were, people thought that if you saw a comet in the sky, it would be the end of the world and it would bring bad luck. So a lot of um, old artwork shows really bad situations when there was a comet in the sky. But nowadays, we have telescopes, we have ground-based telescopes, and we have um, satellites, and we are able to look at comets in all their glory. The one on the bottom left, that is taken at the Mullard Space Science Laboratory, where I did my PhD, from um, 1996. And I remember seeing that comet in the sky for about two weeks. It was absolutely stunning. So like I said, 2061, hopefully before if there is another comet coming before that. But now we are able to visit comets using spacecraft and different satellites. And there have been lots of missions to comets. And there has been a new mission called Comet Interceptor, which is a British, um, partly British-led mission going to visit comets. Um, and that means we know a lot more about them. So we've flown close to comets. We've orbited comets. We've flown in the tail and measured what the tail's made from. And the Deep Impact mission, on the far right, actually fired, effectively fired bullets at the nucleus, the middle bit of the comet, to measure what it, the middle bit, the nucleus, was made from by firing bullets and, and seeing what was ejected, seeing the material that was ejected. And then we had, in 2014, we had the Rosetta mission, which visited this comet, Comet 67P, and it looks a bit like two different comets stuck together or a rubber duck in space. And again, this is a real picture. Um, which I just think is incredible. So because we know so much about comets, I'm able to make an analogy of a comet here in front of you all. It's not going to be as big as the moon. It's only going to be about this big. But what I'm aiming for is to make the nucleus of comet 67P. And because we know what they're made from, we can make a, we can make a model here. So we know they're basically big, dirty snowballs. So I'm going to start by adding some water. And all I've got is a bucket with a black bin bag in because um, it is a little bit messy. So I'll add some water in here. Um, we know that comets have got ammonia in them and that we used to find ammonia in cleaning products. Um, I didn't bring any with me today, but um, just imagine that I put some like cleaning products in there. We know that comets have got alcohol in them, so I'll just put a little bit of that in there. I don't want to put too much in because I'll need that for later after speaking to you all. Um, we know that comets have got methane in them, and methane on the Earth is a gas. It comes from a certain animal, and we actually have a version of that animal over there in the exhibition hall. Any ideas? Shout out. Yeah, exactly. Did it, does anyone want to get a cow to fart in our bucket? Or, no, I'm not going to offer any of you because we don't give off methane. So um, there's also carbon compounds in comets and a few other chemicals and elements. So now we have a bucket full of water, a bit of alcohol, and a bit of fake methane, which doesn't look anything like that comet there. So what I need to do is freeze it. And if I was going to put it in the freezer, and freeze it and we'd have to come back tomorrow, which I don't mind doing, but you might not want to. So I'm going to use this stuff here, um, which is dry ice, to freeze it really quickly. And these pellets are ice pellets, but they are frozen carbon dioxide, the air that we breathe out instead of frozen water. And they're used for fire extinguishers and smoke machines and to freeze um, or keep food cold if you work in industry. And the frozen carbon dioxide starts to sublime. It goes from a solid to a gas, um, with, uh, misses out the liquid phase. It mixes with the water vapor in the air and causes this smoke. And because this smoke is heavier than the air, it actually pours downwards. And if you are able to touch the smoke, you will feel that it's a little bit cold. But don't get out of your chairs. It's just if it gets to you. It's not dangerous. The actual ice is minus 80 degrees, so that is dangerous. But carbon dioxide is what gives us the bubbles in fizzy drinks. So the, the smoke is cold, and it, if you get it on your tongue, it also tastes a little bit fizzy and a little bit acidic because um, it mixes with your saliva to make salicylic acid. But today we're using the, um, the dry ice to make a comet. So I'm going to pour that in there. Whee. And... I'll leave that to cook for a minute. I've been talking to you about comets for the last few minutes, 
But why do we care so much about them? What's, what's the point of knowing more about comets? Well, there's two main reasons. Number one, the whole solar system formed at the same time, about four and a half billion years ago. And comets live really far away from the sun. So they haven't changed much over that time. But the Earth has changed a lot. But Earth, the Earth and comets would have been quite similar when they first formed. So if we learn more about comets now, we can infer more information about what the Earth was like when the Earth was formed. And then the other thing, and these are not real pictures, but we do believe comets may have crashed into the Earth in the past. So it is interesting for us to know about as many comets as we can, to learn more about them just in case they might crash into the Earth in the future. And there is some possibility, because comets are mostly water, that if a comet crashed into the Earth in the past, it might have melted and it might have brought some of the building blocks for life or some of the water to Earth when the Earth was very young and potentially didn't have that much water on it. So I am aiming to make Comet 67P, which is about the size of, well, the, about the size of central London. Um, it's about four kilometers wide. I'm not going to make something four kilometers wide, but we will make a, a version of it. So you can see I put some gloves on now because I'm going to pick it up to show it to, to you. All right, let's have a look. Let's see what we've made. I think I might need a little bit more water. Ooh. But they are really cool object, literally very cold um, and figuratively. And um, I love doing things like this because space science, planetary science, although we've got lots of amazing pictures, sometimes it's quite hard to visualize down here on Earth what, um, you know, some of the stuff that's up in space. So let's just get my fingers around it. They're quite slippery. Hang on. And I'll hold it up so you can see it at the back. And there we go. It looks a little bit like Comet 67P. It's not bad. And what you can see is it's starting to sublime. And this is what it would be like in real, in real life in space. You'd have your comet nucleus, and then you'd have the tail, which is the bit that makes it so beautiful and so fantastic. So I'll leave that um, just there so you can have a look. It's stuck to my glove now, it's that cold. Um, and, and there we go. That is a comet made for you in the exhibition space right in front of your eyes. So at the beginning, I did say, what has studying science and physics and space given me? And hopefully you'll see that the solar system really has changed my life from the people that I've met to the opportunities that I've got from teaching to doing research in Australia and America to going on space camps all over the world and then doing lots of like media and TV and all kinds of things. It's really been quite fun. And um, recently also I've started writing books, particularly children's uh, books about space. And I will be signing those after this talk at the um, Blackwell stand. And what I really love about those, both of those books have got different people on the front and on the right hand side. And I didn't ask for the illustrator to do this, but it looks like me. And that is probably the closest I'll ever get to going into space. But I'm really pleased about those two books. So do come and see me after if you want me to sign them. So I got involved in the space industry. I got excited by the space industry when I saw the film Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks in. And then I went to the library and I learned about astronauts like Helen Sharman and Michael Foll. And I read about their careers. And they had taken the academic path. And Michael Foll had a PhD in astrophysics. So when I was 13, I was like, I'm going to get a PhD in astrophysics. Didn't actually know what that meant back then. But I did study science at school. I'd studied physics at university, I went on space camps in America and Russia and all kinds of cool places and then I did my PhD at um, MSSL in London, well in the UK and there I met my husband or through that I met my husband and now our little boy in the middle, um, he's actually three now but I can't show pictures of him now because they'd be just too cheeky. So you can see that the solar system really has changed my whole life, not just my academic life. 
And I was first inspired by Krista McAuliffe, who um, was a teacher. She was going to be the first teacher astronaut in space, but unfortunately she died in the Challenger disaster. But I think that being a space educator is the best job in the world, and with it, the sky isn't the limit, it is just the beginning. So thank you very much for listening to me today. I hope you've been inspired into the space industry, those of you that can are at a stage of your life that can change your careers, and um, I hope to see you in the future at New Scientist Live. Thank you.